welcome to Calvary Chapel. Uh, Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this beautiful day. Uh, Father, we praise you and thank you that we live in this wonderful country. We just pray that you would continue to to bless it and, Father, to correct us when we need it. Father, that you would uh, just uh, be our God. Father, I pray that you would bless every aspect of the service, that you would be with Pastor Tony as he brings us your word, that you would be with our worship that would be from our hearts, Father, and that you would also be with the children and the youth as they uh, learn more about your ways and learn to walk in all of your ways. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. I can see waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear our God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. Same power that rose Jesus from the grave, same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm the raging sea, lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. We have hope that His promises are true. In His strength, there is nothing we can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. Same power that commands the dead to wake lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm the raging sea lives in us, lives in us. He lives in us, lives in us. Greater is he that is living in me. He's conquered our Corinthians 3.11 says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Psalm 145.3 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of all our praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus' name above every other name Jesus, 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show
I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your sing your praise again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Uh, we'll go over the bulletins right now. Um, first thing is, is uh, plenty of sanitizer all around. Just look for it and uh, get some on you, at least your hands, and uh, <laughs> maintain a safe distance if you would. Re please be respectful of that. Um, and this is the first Sunday of the month, so we are going to be doing communion uh, right after uh, service here. And then um, we are still meeting in the Home Fellowship up in Pine Top, if you're interested, at 6.30 on Thursdays. So if uh, you might want to attend that, uh, track me down after service, and I'll tell you how to get there. And uh, we're also still doing a Wednesday prayer service, so if you want to come up for prayer, we're going to be here at 9 across the street over there in the youth room uh, from 9 a.m. to at least 10. And so if you want to pray with a, a group of people, come on out for that. And uh, we're going to be praying for, as usual, the, not only the church, our times, but this nation. So uh, think about that. Uh, if you have any kind of needs, spiritual or physical, don't forget to let us know so we can at least pray for them. But we can also help you out, too, as well. We'll try to do whatever we can. On the back of the chairs there is a card that you can fill out um, to let us know what uh, is going on if you're visiting or uh, you have a need. And uh, put those in the agape boxes. They're located at the back of the sanctuary there. And uh, we're, we, th that's uh, where we put our uh, tithes and offerings in there in those boxes. Uh, so if you would do that. There's also one out there in the foyer. Uh, at this time, make sure your cell phones are off so you don't interrupt the service. And then uh, safely greet one another. <laughs> All right? <laughs> God bless. <laughs>
Oh. <laughs> it's computer. <laughs> We're on. So are you beating, beating in or are you just starting? She's just starting. Just, okay. No, you're starting this. You're doing that boop, do do, do do. Just, okay, well, we'll, we'll speed you up or slow you down. <laughs> I raise a hallelujah. Um, I can't. I can't. I think it sounds good. It sounds good, Helen. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, yeah, because we're on. <clears throat> Lots of new people. There's lots of new people here. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thank you. She's taking okay. job. Yeah. Okay, let's I be like making our way back to our seats. And we're going to do one more song before Pastor Tony comes up. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm, louder and louder. Gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. With everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of a mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. Sing a little louder, sing a little louder, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder, 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 the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief, sing a little louder, my weapon is the melody, sing a little louder, my heaven comes to fight for me, sing a little louder. middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive i'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Praise you. Amen. 
Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. You can go ahead and take your seats uh, if you're not already seated. And would you open your Bibles with me, please, to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22 as we continue our way through uh, the Old Testament. And uh, uh, I hope you had a, a great Fourth of July, <laughs> a great Independence Day, and uh, that uh, it wasn't too crazy if you had to go out and fight in the traffic and all that. Uh, we were involved in the Back the Blue March uh, yesterday, my wife and I, and we did the walk and all that, and uh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> we had a, had a blast, and uh, it, was, um, it was neat to, to let uh, our law enforcement officers know uh, that you know we're we're here for them and that we appreciate them and all and uh, it may turn into a, a yearly event. So if it does, we'll let you know next year. <laughs> and uh, uh, something else, uh, just kind of a reminder, and just in case you know if, if you're just visiting or uh, you happen to come, or whatever. Uh, if uh, if you can. Uh, give us a call, shoot us an email, do something like that to get on the list so that way we reserve a seat for you because right now, you know, we're doing the social distancing thing and we can't, uh, can't uh, just say, yeah, come on, just let's do church like normal. Wish we could. I thought by now, July, I thought by now for sure, you know, it, that uh, everything would be back pretty much to normal, but... Um, uh, you know, <laughs> the COVID cooties has uh, other kind of plans, I guess, you know, but we'll, we'll just trust the Lord through all of this. And uh, if you can't make it sometime, uh, you know, we're uh, doing this uh, over the Internet. Uh, you can listen on our web uh, page or you can uh, watch the video on our YouTube page. Uh, and so you can do that uh, just in case you can't make it. So, with all that said, and your Bible's open up, 2 Samuel 22, let's pray. Father, Lord, we do thank you. We thank you, Lord, for you, for who you are, your grace, your mercy, your kindness, your love that you have for us. Lord, we've worshipped you in song. Lord, we've praised you in, in our singing. But Lord, now we want to worship you. Lord, by really giving heed to your word, by, by hearing what you would say to us, open our hearts now. Lord, cause us to hear from you that you might make changes in us. Lord, to make us more like you. That you would, you would use this time now to help conform us into the image of your Son, Father. Lord, we need that. We know that's your desire for us. So, Father, speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's teaching is, How Do You Want God to Treat You? Now, that sounds like a pretty strange title, doesn't it? it sounds a little weird. You know, and, and some maybe think, well, wait a minute, isn't God unchanging? And doesn't He treat everyone the same? Isn't our relationship with the Lord based on His grace and nothing else? Well, let's see today. Let's see if there, there's something that we might be missing. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 22, it, this whole chapter is a song of praise from David to the Lord. It's recorded again in Psalm 18, almost word for word. And much of it is very personal. How, how God delivered David through all of his trials. And in it, David uses a lot of poetic language, a lot of symbolism. Like he refers to God as my rock, my fortress, a lamp, a shield. It talks about smoke coming from God's nostrils because he's angry. In fact, let's go ahead and read the first two verses of chapter 22. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Now, is God literally a rock? A big chunk of stone somewhere? <laughs> yeah, of course not, right? But what David is expressing is how firm and, and how stable the Lord is. That we can be assured that if we rely on Him, 
if we lean on him, that he will never be moved. God isn't soft and, and mushy, you know, giving in to pressure. And most of the song is like this as David praises and expresses his gratitude to the Lord. And David proclaims to all those who would read, this is how God is. This is how good God is. This is how faithful God is. And in this chapter, I encourage you, read the whole chapter. We're not going to today. But when you get home, read the whole thing. It, because in this chapter, we find a lot of reasons that we can put our trust in the Lord. And a lot of reasons why we can find hope in the midst of our trials. Now, we can apply uh, all those ways that God moved in David's life to our lives. And, and, and we can know, hey, these are the things God might do for us. This is, this is how, what God does. But there's a few verses here that we're going to look at where David says specifically, this is how God operates. What you and I can expect from God. And for many, what we see here today, you just might get surprised as to what you do see here. Now, to set this up, I got a question for you. Is God indifferent to sin? Is God indifferent to sin? Is it all the same to God if I rob, cheat, steal, commit adultery, lie, all that? Or if I treat people fairly, honestly, and keep my marriage vows? Is it all the same to God whichever way I live? Does it matter to God how we live? Look at what David writes on this subject as he praises God, right in the middle of this whole song. And remember, David is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 26 through 28. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty, that you may bring them down. Within those three verses, we see quite a contrast in the way that God shows or reveals himself to people. Folks, so often the way that God deals with us is based on how we deal with others. Now, somebody may be thinking, hey, that sounds like a worse works-based relationship. No, but here's another question. Do you think God is ignorant? Do you think he's stupid? Do you, do you think he doesn't know what's going on? And if you've already settled the question in your mind, is God indifferent to sin? You have to put those two thoughts together, don't you? And some people kind of think of God as he's some kind of impersonal force to be manipulated, like, like in Star Wars, right? Use the force. And a lot of times that's the way people think about God. They're going to use God. Folks, an impersonal force has no will, has no agenda, has no moral standards, has no mind. God is a person. In fact, He's three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one true living God, Yahweh. And God has a will. God has moral standards. He has an agenda. And He's declared all of that in His Word. The Lord doesn't treat all people alike. If he did, it'd make God out to be morally indifferent and, and that he doesn't care what people do. That picture of God is never found in the Bible. God is aware of what everyone does, and he especially is concerned with his kids and our character. We see that in Scripture as well. And as a good father, out of love, he will encourage, he will challenge, and even discipline us in order to accomplish the goal or agenda that he has for us. And that agenda, folks, is to be conformed into the image of Christ. Now think about it. Let's just take the first attribute there, mercy. He says, with the mer merciful, you will show yourself merciful. And some of your Bibles may say faithful, 
Some of your Bibles, instead of mercy or merciful, will say loyal. And that Hebrew word could be translated in any of those ways. But let's just let's go with mercy. All right. That's what's in the old King James. That's what's in my new King James Bible. And we could take we won't. But we could take each one of those attributes and and we could take mercy or faithful or faithfulness and, and and look at those things. And it would be just the same. But let's go with mercy and let's answer the question. Is God merciful? Does he show or extend kindness, forgiveness, or pity to those who don't deserve it? Does he oftentimes withhold punishment to those who do deserve it? Absolutely, doesn't he? Else we'd all be toast, right? <laughs> Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In Deuteronomy 4, 31, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. In 1 Chronicles 16, 34, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Do you know that phrase, his mercy endures forever, appears 41 times in the Old Testament? I think God's trying to tell us something about himself, huh? We serve a merciful God. And even in the very place where God would meet with the Old Testament high priest, he would meet with the high priest once a year. Even where he would meet there, within the Holy of Holies, where they would sprinkle the blood on the, uh, of the atonement, was at the mercy seat. Think about it. He calls that the mercy seat. God would meet with the high priest above the mercy seat. Folks, the mercy seat was a lid over the Ark of the Covenant. And within the Ark of the Covenant, that's where the law was. Think about that. God put mercy over the law. God put mercy between us and the law. If he didn't, again, we would be toast. We'd be like the guy in, remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? When the Nazi dude, they took the lid off. They took the mercy seat off and looked inside the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, they melted right there. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, you know, all these pretty gory scene there. But that would be us if we had to stand before God with just the law there before us. We couldn't do it. But God put the mercy seat between us and the law. That's the God who David is praising. And God wanted his people. He wanted his people Israel to be merciful like he was merciful. In Micah 6.8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. See, God desires mercy from His people, not sacrifice. He, he's not pleased with a bunch of money that's given when that same person is showing no mercy and treating people around them harshly. God isn't happy about that. He's not blessed by that kind of an offering. Folks, how we treat people will affect how God deals with us. Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Now, do you want God to show himself to you as abundantly merciful <laughs> as the, the merciful God that he is? Do you want God to show himself to you that way? Mm, that's a question. <laughs> Is it, well, then be merciful. Show mercy to those that you deal with. Now, I know somebody might be thinking, oh, pastor, that's Old Testament. 
All those verses I quoted, yeah, they're from the Old Testament. And, and oh, that's under the law. We're under the new covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. God doesn't deal with us according to our sin, but according to his grace. See, someone who would think that is not only confusing grace with license, but misunderstands God and his agenda for us. You think it's okay now, under the New Testament, under the blood of Christ, to treat people badly and expect God to treat you mercifully? Think that's okay? No way. Is, is that what Jesus taught? Is that what we read in the New Testament? In Matthew 5, 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, think about that. If the merciful shall obtain mercy, and they're blessed because of that, then isn't the opposite inferred? That if you're not merciful, you won't obtain mercy? Even going further, Matthew 7, chapter 2, Jesus said, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, do you want God to be harsh with you? Think about that. Do you really want God to nitpick every one of your faults? <laughs> no way, Jose, man. No way. Because if he did, let me tell you, there's so many things that we do that we don't realize are sin. If God really wanted to be nitpicky with us, oh man, he could find faults with us. I mean, th think about it. Even getting down to every decision we make. You know, if we're not considering God's will in every decision, that's sin. How many times have you thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, and you haven't prayed about it? You haven't thought about what Scripture says about it? Yeah, you know, it's like God want to? He, he could really expose a lot of our sins. He could look into our hearts, and he does, and he sees our motivations and, and all that, our, the intentions, the thoughts of our hearts. Folks, I'm one of the biggest boneheads on this planet. I need all the mercy I can get. So I try and be as merciful as I can be. I try to overlook as much as I can when it comes to people's faults, especially when it comes to people sinning against me or treating me wrong. Because, again, I want and I need all the mercy that God has. I need it. And consider this, too. You think, well, I don't sin that much. I was, you know, well, I'm fine. Folks, all of us do sin. And like I said, if God wanted to be really nitpicky with us, if he didn't want to be merciful and all that, and if you give him reason not to be merciful with you, oh, he can find fault. 1 John 1.8 tells us, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And 1 John 1.10 says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So it's pretty clear we all need mercy. And when someone refuses to acknowledge their sin, trying to make themselves out to, to be the, like they never sin, isn't that a manifestation of pride? I mean, the worst kind of pride. It's spiritual pride. <laughs> Some of Jesus' harshest words when he walked this earth were to the religious leaders of his day. Those, because of their spiritual pride, tried to pretend like they were perfect when they were so far from perfect. And because of their spiritual pride, it came out in the way they treated people. They treated people harsh. They treated people without mercy. And we see it over and over again. And you know, one of the things that Jesus said to them, Matthew 15, 7 and 8, he said, hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, was and is Christ merciful? <laughs> okay, if he wasn't, none of us would be here. But look at how merciful Christ is. If anyone could condemn someone, well, he could, right? He didn't need God to show him mercy, right? He didn't need the Father to show him mercy because he was perfect. He knew no sin. 
But yet he was so merciful. In John chapter 8, uh, one morning, Jesus, while he's teaching in the temple area, and there's probably several hundred people around there listening to him teach. The proud, self-righteous leaders brought a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery and, and, and tossed her right in the middle of everyone that was there listening to Jesus. And they said in John 8, 5, Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? See, they knew that Jesus was merciful. They had a reputation of it. They saw him acting in mercy all the time. And they wanted to have a legal charge against him for not obeying the law. Now, we know the story, right? When they did that, he, you know, he ignored them. He bent down. He wrote in the dirt with his finger. What he wrote, we don't know. <laughs> you know, my guess is he started writing the names of all those leaders that were there. And then <laughs> they, they didn't... Kind of, they didn't acknowledge that or whatever. Uh, it didn't seem to bother them at all. And, and uh, they continued asking him. And when they did, look at verse 7 there, John 8. It says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And the old King James, you know, cast a stone, you know, who's ever without sin. <laughs> You'd be the first one to cast a stone. Now, that really didn't seem to deter them. We don't see anything that they did because of what he said there until what Jesus did next. In verse 8, it says, And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Again, we don't know what he wrote. Now, some have suggested that he wrote each of the leaders' sins next to their name that they were secretly involved in. Possible. Some believe that this woman was a prostitute. And that's how they knew where they could go and catch her in the act. And so some people believe because of that, that what he wrote was next to their names was the dates that they had been with that woman. Whatever he wrote, all of a sudden, they all realized that they had some kind of pressing engagements elsewhere. And they left. And then in John 8, 9, we read, Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now again, if anyone had the moral high ground and could condemn her without needing mercy, <laughs> it was Jesus. He didn't condemn her, though. He showed her mercy. Look at... John 8, 10 and 11. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I mean, think about that. He's not condoning sin. He's not blowing off sin. He says, <laughs> I'm not condemning you, but go and sin no more. He's telling her to repent, but he doesn't condemn her. And remember, we're looking at how God treats us being based on how we treat each other. And I believe that Jesus exposed the sins of those leaders who were full of spiritual pride while they were condemning this woman. And we see Jesus deal mercifully with her. This, this woman that was being humiliated, and she wasn't justifying herself. She responded in a very humble way. Just what David said in our text and back in verse 28, where David said, You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. Seeing how merciful God is, how merciful Jesus is to us, folks, we should be merciful to everyone around us. We call ourselves Christians, and we know that means to be Christ-like. And, and we know that according to 2 Corinthians 5.20, we're to be ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of the kingdom of God, representing God. We're to represent God to the whole world. And God is merciful. But when we refuse to be merciful, then the Lord will chastise us. 
and withhold mercy from us as if to say, how do you like it? He'll get our attention. He'll chastise us. You know, he'll take us out to the woodshed. (laughs) The way we treat others will affect how God deals with us. Now, you may still be thinking, oh, no, no, you're off, Pastor. You're off. Well, think about some other things here. Think about the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And it really probably better would be referred to as the model prayer. In, Mark, in Matthew, rather, uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, we're familiar with it. Jesus taught us, saying, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, after he gives him that example prayer, look what Jesus emphasizes. Look at the only thing that he comments on, on that model prayer. Verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Does that mean that someone that does that, all of a sudden they become you know, hard-hearted and they stop forgiving, does that mean that they lose their salvation if they were really saved? I don't believe so. But we've talked about this in the last couple of weeks. We've seen over and over again through Scripture that sin gets in the way of our fellowship with the Lord. And when we refuse to forgive the people around us, that's sin. And then God turns around, I believe, and says, no, I don't want to talk to you. (laughs) You know, you want to be like that? Well, you know, go be like that. But I'm not hanging with you. (laughs) I'm not listening to you until you repent. And just in case (laughs) you're not convinced. And I'm going to read a large chunk of scripture right now. And I'm not going to comment on it other than a couple little spots there. But it just kind of give you the impact of what was happening here in Matthew 18, starting verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That'd be like about six or eight million dollars today. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, about six thousand bucks. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down to his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Now, just so we understand what Jesus meant, Jesus made it to where there was no doubt what he meant to his disciples 
Look what he says at the end there, Matthew 18, 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Ouch, huh? How do you want God to deal with you? I think that's something that we need to think about all the time. I think it's something that we could, should consider. Every time we have to deal with each other, every time we start getting our socks in a knot because somebody has offended us, they didn't say what we wanted them to say. They didn't look at us the right way. You really want God to deal with you that way? No way, folks. James 2.13 tells us, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You want to be victorious in your Christian walk? You want to triumph over those trials and all that? Well, don't worry about judgment. That's God's job. You be concerned with mercy. Be concerned with showing grace and mercy to those people around you. And, you know, we just looked at one aspect there that David talked about. There were several. And we could look at all of the attributes of God (laughs) and see that God wants us to be like Him. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants us to be merciful. He wants us to be kind. He wants us to be loving. He wants us to be pure. He wants us to be humble. And folks, like I said, I... For me, I need all the mercy I can get. I need all the grace I can get. And so do you, whether you know it or not. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus said, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, this sums up all of the law and the prophets, all of the Old Testament. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And without Fear of blasphemy, I'll add this. Whatever you want God to do to you, do that to others also. I I think that's what we see here today. And you know what, folks? If we'll do that, not only will things go better for us, because God will be just heaping His grace and His mercy upon us, (laughs) but we'll be accurate representatives of the kingdom of God. God will be using us in ways that you never thought that he would. Folks, less, not just do unto others what you want others to do to you, but less do to others what we want God to do to us. We'll be so much better off. Amen? This is the first Sunday of the month, and we set that aside to um, practice communion or the Lord's Supper, uh, however you want to term it. And the worship team, you can come on up. Uh, And the guys that are going to serve communion, you guys want to come on up. Uh, We practice what's called open communion. And we believe, because of God's mercy, because of His grace, that you don't have to be a a member of Calvary Chapel of the White Mountains, but just a a member of the body of Christ. You believe in Him, you trust in Him, then we encourage you uh, when the elements come by uh, to uh, take one. Are we, are we handing them now? You're going you're gonna to hold the tray and they will pick from it? Okay. And um, everything's been sanitized. And by the way, if you're uh, a gluten-free type of folk, these are gluten-free crackers. So you're safe there too, all right? <laughs> shepherd I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. I will 
just in case I, I forgot to say anything, but the cracker is in the uh, cup underneath, in, in case you haven't done it this way before. Uh, and if you haven't done so already, when you take them apart, you might want to twist them a little bit as you pull, otherwise you may get a, a baptism of grape juice there. Uh, so, you know, what we hold in our hands, in, in considering what we looked at today, God's mercy and His grace and how we should be merciful, Folks, this is, this is something that should just scream at us every time we take communion. This should really just speak so loudly of the grace and the mercy of God. That God loved us so much that he sent his only son to come and die for us. I mean, you think of the mercy and the grace involved there. That what we hold in our hands represents the the. The, the cracker, the uh, unleavened bread, represents the sinless body of Christ. The, the fruit of the vine, the juice, represents the blood of Jesus Christ. That in God's grace, in His mercy, He, he sent His Son to pay the price for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. And each time we take communion, as Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Folks, we should, when we partake of communion, be reminded that we should be merciful too because God was so merciful with us. Father, we hold these elements up to you and we pray that you'd bless them to us. Father, that as we partake of these elements, Lord, in doing this in remembrance of your Son and remembering what you did for us, Lord, may... We remember that every time someone offends us, every time that we deal with somebody and they don't quite meet our expectations. Father, help us to be merciful. Lord, use this unleavened bread now to remind us of the body of Jesus that was broken because of mercy because of your grace, that we would be merciful as well. Let's partake. And Lord, also use this cup to remind us of the blood that was shed to remove our sins. Again, mercy, grace, forgiveness, that you gave to us when we didn't deserve it at all. Lord, may we, upon drinking this, as we partake of this, that we, Lord, would never allow ourselves to be harsh and judgmental and, and unforgiving, unmerciful. Lord, bless this cup now as we partake. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and worship him with one last song. Our last song is in honor of God and our country. And it's Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage with the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Marching on. 
In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory of his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. Our God is marching on. Amen. <laughs> God bless you, folks. Have a great rest of the uh, weekend and a blessed next week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Yes, ma'am.